Hello, everyone. This is Jim Hughes with AFIO Now. We are a program of recorded interviews with senior U.S. intelligence officers. And today we have a very special guest. His name is Christian Rasmussen, and he is the founder of the Terraline Project. To help me today, I'm very pleased to welcome Jennifer Daniels. Jennifer is a retired NGA officer, having spent 37 years there, starting out as an imagery analyst at Old Building 213, and then rising to a number of very senior positions. And I'm also pleased to say, now an AFIO board member. Jennifer, welcome to AFIO Now. Thank you, Jim. And I am very pleased to be able to interview Chris today. Chris has always been a leader in pushing for greater openness and transparency in the intelligence community, as well as in the DOD. He is the architect of the Unclassified GWINT Pathfinder Initiative that was designed to increase the transparency of GWINT and provide intelligence to those who don't or can't operate in the classified world or have limited access to classified networks. Chris was instrumental in pioneering the IC's use of Web 2.0 for knowledge management and information sharing, such as wikis, blogs, social tagging services, and internal social networks. He is the recipient of several prestigious awards for innovation and leadership, such as the Intelligence Community's Transparency Team of the Year, NGA's Challenger Award, and the DNI's Exceptional Pioneer Award. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Good to be here. It's great to have you here, and it's good to see you again. You too. Um, Chris, to start out, could you please describe Terraline reporting and the focus of the content for our audience? Yeah, it's pretty broad. So if you go to the website, you can see that there's strategic military issues, economic issues, uh, human rights abuse issues, climate change issues. So it spans a pretty wide range of topics. So it's it's pretty broad. You know, how we kind of select those, we ask kind of two guiding questions when we're negotiating with our partners on these. We ask, does the group under study actively hide the activity? And if they knew we were watching, would they change their behavior? And if the answer is no and no, you have a pretty safe question. If you run it through an economic one, for an example, do the Vietnamese hide dam construction? No, they don't. Would they change their behavior knowing that we're studying it? No, they wouldn't apply uh, D&D techniques to a dam because there would be massive economic problems with doing that. So that's how we keep in that safe face. That's kind of our line, our bright line of where we select topics with partners. So we don't get into tactical maneuver type of things because the answer to that, those questions often are yes. So that's the kind of calculus that we use. And that came from the Pathfinder. Um, and we'll, uh, I'm sure that we'll get into that later, but that's kind of the calculus that we use. Thanks, Jim. Um, really appreciate that description of what you're, what you're doing. So why did you create the Terraline Reporting application? And when was the first report posted? And maybe you could tell us a little story about what it took to get that first one posted. Sure. Yeah, so it came out of the, the GeoInt Pathfinder. Uh, many things came out of uh, Pathfinder. This is just kind of the one, the most noticeable one. Uh, classification rewrite stuff is not, people aren't going to see that, but that was instrumental with Pathfinder behind the scenes at NGA. But it was designed to deliver content to somebody's phone you know, outside the SCIF. Um, so we had two sides to the application, uh, a side that runs without authentication and a side that you need to authenticate to see the content, kind of like a paywall architecture. The one that has grown the most post Pathfinder is the non-authenticated one that everyone sees. So the first report that came out uh, was in 2018. You might have been in the audience for this one, Jennifer. It was on it, it was debuted on stage at GeoInt conference in 2018. At the time, Director Cardillo, I was having a conversation with former Director Long, and the subject came up about innovation, and it turned this conversation into that, and, and they debuted the first article, which was on North Korea modernization, apartment construction, and things like that, so a good economic issue. And the question was, you started your first one with North Korea. Again, you can do North Korea as long as those two questions are safe. Do the North Koreans hide a building apartment complexes? No. Would they stop doing that, knowing that we're watching? No. So even North Korea, you can do and do safely. So that was the first one that debuted. It was, it took a lot of people by surprise of the quality of the piece. And the author was invited to speak at NJ's Korea Days. It got quite a bit of good feedback from DIA, CIA, and other kind of economic working group customers. So when the Terraline links are published, 
a lot of people take those and they, they disseminate those to their working groups, the economic working groups, the climate working groups. So that's how people become aware internally of when new articles come out. Uh, so that's how they're kind of shared. But that was the first one that we started off with uh, in North Korea and, and did started off with, with a bang there. Thanks, Chris. Who was your partner for that first one? It was called the North Korea Economy Watch. They're a, we partner with nonprofits, and that was the first partner. It was a gentleman and a very small team who, who were, their sole website was to do economic reporting in North Korea. They reached out early, kind of hearing about the program, and that was the first one. There were two others in draft, but that was the one that made it first. Uh, so we had one with CSIS in draft that they might have been the first, but it was the North Korea Economy Watch uh, that was the first one out the gate. Right, Chris. Can you um, now provide our audience with a recent example of one of the Terraline reports and, and how that one is being used and the impact it's had? Sure. I'll use a really, really geeky one, which is a machine learning one, and then a more analytic one uh, that just recently came out. So we did a deep learning piece in partnership with a PhD candidate at William & Mary. And what he built was a, a neural net that looked at and measured economic activity of, of industrial targets at massive scale all across China. And it, it, the system analyzed about 3,000 images. He correlated that with also Nightlights data, which is public and open to build this system. Uh, so it's really, really cool. Uh, that's a very technical one. Um, the NRO, when NGA does these, uh, when they come out, they have a great social media presence on all of the major platforms, and they make these summary videos for them that go into social media. And the NRO, you know, retweeted that one and said, awesome work. So that's good for uh, because our partnerships with imagery come from in collaboration with NRO. So they get to see the type of data barter work and work that we're doing with Terraline. So that's a real techie one. Another one that came out that's, that's not a techie one is cultural heritage uh, damage in Ukraine. So we partnered with the Cultural Heritage Monitoring Lab, which is a group, a kind of a hybrid of the Smithsonian Museum and the uh, Virginia Natural History Museum. And they specialize in looking at cultural heritage sites around the world. So that's churches, museums, cemeteries, and things like that that are protected. They analyzed and confirmed damage at 108 sites in Terline, and that went out. That had a pretty broad reach. Watching it again, just the visual analytics within Facebook, within LinkedIn, a lot of archaeologists, a lot of preservationists, a lot of UN folks. And then the feedback that I get behind the curtain, it has been used in planning circles with our allies uh, in that effort. So I get the qualitative feedback behind the curtain, uh, and then I pass that to the partner of how it's being used internally. Uh, so that one was a big, that one was a big hit. No, those were both excellent articles, and I did enjoy learning more about convolutional neural network. Yeah, um, yes. I remember when I first heard of those things in the algorithms, and I was skeptical, but there's been a lot of examples of how that's worked, and um, it was good to see it in practice by William and Mary. Yeah. All right. So, Chris, could you tell us a little more about who your customers are and how they're using chairline reporting? Sure. I gave two examples uh, there. Some other ones um, that we have, the State Department has used our human rights abuse content. So we did a piece in partnership with RAN on the, um, uh, the abuses of Uyghurs uh, in China. Uh, that was used in official Twitter handles from the State Department, multiple ones as, as a, a coordinated campaign uh, to bring pressure on that. So that was a, a really cool example. Um, we have, again, economic uh, working groups internally, climate change working groups internally that consume the content as well. And even on the technical side, DARPA and NSA have taken the data and scraped it and used it in machine learning models itself. So they take the content kind of like a, many do in, in the knowledge management world with Wikipedia. It serves as a knowledge base. So they're using the content itself as a knowledge base to grow and sharpen different models. We also have a congressionally directed action to produce more China content. So whenever China strategic military content or economic content or Belt Road content comes out, we send those, our points of contact, send those directly to oversight. So that's that's pretty neat. So those are some examples of the, the usage of it. I'm missing a few, but if I think of any more as other questions come, uh, we can, I'll add them in. Those are the okay. top of my head. 
Yeah, thanks, Chris. That would be great because it leads right into uh, my next question, which is, you know, how many partners and participants do you have? And, and can you tell us, I mean, you've told us quite a bit about who they are, but is there someone that stands out that you haven't mentioned? So we have, right now, we have about 15 active partners. There's um, there's others that are coming in. We recently held this uh, Terline Ask Me Anything event, kind of modeled on Reddit, and about 50 organizations showed up. Um, so we are processing those now. So you're going to see a big spike in content from that partnership base. But there's probably, you know, around 15 uh, in, the, in the system now that are drafting content. So we're in the nonprofit space, and that's pretty broad. So it goes all the way from, again, the Smithsonian, the Stimson Center, 38 North, RAND, CSIS, and then William & Mary undergrad. And with that's and that's been, I've gotten pretty cool letters from the deans at, say, William & Mary, say that this is really hard in a good way. So that brand that's up there, those students have to get it up to the Stimson Center level or the RAND level. Um, and there's a lot of back and forth that goes on with those articles. So the RAND ones, the CSIS ones, that takes about you know two hours to go back and forth uh, with our kind of uh, methodology consultation. But if some of the students are approaching this for the very first time, students at the University of Texas, William & Mary, Columbia University, even, you know, th these are very, very good schools, and it's really hard to get an original research piece out, and particularly original research with imagery. A lot of the times, the students, this is their first exposure to ever doing imagery beyond bringing up a map on their phone. So it's a crash course in getting that up to, up to tear line quality, and original research is hard. This is why you see on tear line, we only release an article, you know, a couple a quarter, uh, maybe one or two a month because it takes months to research one of these. So they're in draft behind the curtain, kind of being version controlled and everyone's commenting and stuff for a long time for you, for people to see it live. It's fast. That is fascinating, Chris. Makes me want to go back to college and do some of that research. <laughs> um, I, you know, with my political science background, I'm like, wow, this is great. I would love that when I was in college. So I'm going to have to recommend that to uh, some of the young people that I know. Is there one article that a student has done that really stands out in your mind? And could you describe it? Uh, there's been uh, all really, really good ones, but I'll use one example where these students got from very little experience to creating a open radar change detection service to measure coal-fired commission plants in China in three months. So this was the height of the pandemic, and Columbia has been a good partner, Columbia University. And they wanted to, the two questions that they were looking at, they wanted to measure to see if the Chinese were commissioning coal fire plants at the peak of COVID or letting the workers stay at home. And what, what we built is we took, made an open radar change detection service in Google Earth Engine. So Google Earth Engine is a massive analytic platform that's free. Uh, academics use it. It's a great platform. It's not Google Earth that people you know drive around in. This is the more heavy analytics. You build um, services inside of it at massive scale. Um, so they took open um, radar data from Sentinel and then looked at hundreds and hundreds of images that they didn't look, but they built the, the system to look at it. And it showed uh, that the Chinese did not let up during COVID and commissioned five new coal-fired plants. And this system is is pretty accurate in, in detecting general activity because the like kind of the press reporting, the economic reporting, the su supply chain reporting in China is sometimes exaggerated. So this was a good way to objectively look at it through open radar data. And it was an amazing piece. And they built that within 90 days. Some of them had a Python background. So there was a coding background, but none of them had a specific GeoInt background. And they hustled and got to that amazingly quickly uh, and made an awesome piece. The other thing that they built was a green detector. Um, so China has planted millions of trees uh, with these carbon sink initiatives, and they wanted to know if this was working. Um, so again, they built this change detection service that uh, detects green reflectance from vegetation. And what it showed is a lot of the trees, they planted a lot of trees, but a lot of them are dying and haven't been growing. Uh, again, so they they created two services like that incredibly quickly. Um, and this is the cool thing about where GeoInt is with the democratization of it. The things I'm describing 
are kind of broadly known in the public domain. You just have to grab certain parts. A lot of the open data sets are out there. The, um, the capability, particularly Google Earth Engine, is out there for free. Um, you just have to kind of be creative on what you're trying to look at uh, to answer a niche question. And both of those pieces were enormously successful uh, within the climate change working groups at NGA and other places. Um, again, our point of contact, the, the NGO for climate uh, and economic issues, um, loved those pieces and shared them very, very broadly uh, with his colleagues at DNI and even the White House uh, working groups that are heavily involved in, in climate issues. And they went from zero to that in 90 days. Wow, that, that's terrific. I mean, I can't wait for these people to uh, join our business and uh, enter into the intelligence community. Uh, it will be a real plus. Um, does NGA provide data to your partners and to the students? We do. So that was one of the things that was uh, experimented with in Pathfinder. Uh, we didn't want to cut huge contracts because that you know we wanted to keep the price down. Uh -huh. um, so we said, hey, you know what we can do? Let's exchange data where we can. And that'll be the center um, financial piece rather than cutting a contract for labor. So it, we can trade the data, if you will, in return for high quality reporting. And the vast majority of what people want is Maxar. Um, so the NGA's huge purchase, purchasing power and the third party power of that license allows us to do that. And that's what most folks are after. Um, we can sponsor Planet, the little ones that are about the size of a toaster. But again, the technical talent goes up when you have more non-literal images, right? So you just you, anyone can look and do a good job visually, literally, and write something of very, very high quality. But you know, with with radar data, with some of the new sensors coming on, like Capella and things like that, you need a technical talent base beyond kind of literal imagery interpretation to make something of value. So we have offered that to folks, and people have experimented with it. Uh, but the vast majority of people want high quality commercial electro optical. That's what they're looking for because. Look, the average price is pretty high for even a single image still, right? It's getting better, but schools, nonprofits, the North Korea Economy Watch, they don't have that big of a credit card, right, to throw down and buy 10 images. We do. So when there's a direct federal benefit and we, you know, as, as the, the content I've described, there's a clear benefit on making it, we can extend that to a third party and cover the cost for that. So that's mostly what people want is, is electro-optical, but other sensors are coming online. I have a great relationship with uh, Dave Gauthier in the commercial business office, and when new sensors come online, they always want to offer it to Tearline uh, to see if we can experiment with it. <clears throat> it's just that the, the more non-literal ones, they're just harder to do because in many cases, you have to build something like in Google Earth Engine to do a good job with it. You just can't just look down and go. So that's the kind of the barrier to entry is a little bit higher on those. Okay. Great, Chris. I can see why they would want to use some of the high resolution imagery. You really can see a lot more tell and tell a lot more. But you're right about some of the other sources in the non-literal is different information that you can gain from them. So your website states that NGA verifies the analytic methods but does not edit the analytic conclusions. Could you tell us how this is accomplished? Sure. So when we were starting out um, doing the negotiations with schools, they were very, very reluctant to tie editorial control to a third party in the name of academic freedom. And that makes a lot of sense. This is not NJ product. So this is their intellectual property. NJ helps with imagery and we provide geoint consulting services that focuses mostly on the methodology. So NJ is not going to get in there and do happy versus glad. They're not going to say change this sentence or we won't publish it. It's more focused on the methodology side of it. So an, an example, if someone has two data points and cites a broad trend, the feedback would be, hey, why don't we cite five data points to cite a broad trend? Because that's a small sample size. So it stays on things like that, the methodology side of things to balance academic freedom, because there's not any group that's going to hitch their wagon to a third party with editorial control. So that's how we kind of thread the needle is we stay on that side of things. And the customers and our, excuse me, our partners have really loved the back and forth of, did you think of this? Hey, this might be this. So it stays there. We're not getting into, you know, move this up to the top. That's all stylistic stuff. 
and we stay away from that completely. So it stays, it does a good job of balancing academic freedom with something that NJ is very good at institutionally, staring at things from outer space longer than any group <laughs> with the predecessor organizations on Earth. So that knowledge is passed to, it, 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 as you can see, it produces a, a pretty uh, great output. Great. Have you had instances where you weren't able to have that back and forth and um, some of the analytic methods weren't approved so that they uh, were not approved and put onto NGA sites? No, I, again, like when we do the, you know, from Pathfinder, kind of the OPSEC rules and we call the Pathfinder rules, because, you know, the things that we do, we know this trade space pretty well, the open source space. I've been in it for 15 plus years and I know what state of the art is and isn't and what is worth protecting and not protecting. Um, so if there hasn't been a case of doing that because we're riffing on broad, broadly known methodologies within the public domain, within academia. So you just have to know what to protect, kind of, you know, what is patentable? Um, that's the kind of standard that I use. Is it truly transformative? Is it really original? Does it pass the non-obvious test? And those are the types of things that are worth protections if the answer is yes. But just the fact that we are doing this is not does not warrant protection. Uh, so we kind of move past the are we interested in X question? And the, and, and Terraline has really helped with that. Again, people see Terraline, but another huge thing that came from Pathfinder was I helped. Um, I served on the uh, classification rewrite uh, committee uh, that, that did our new consolidated guide. And a lot of those tips from Pathfinder were put in and hundreds of items were declassified and downgraded for those practical reasons. Because when the kind of when the classification guides were cut, many of them were cut in the 80s and 90s and we're just in a different world. That's why it needed a relook. So we were sequestered <laughs> out with a group. It was tense. But it was worthwhile to do that for, for several days and just really get into it of why is this line item classified? What are we protecting? What is known in the public domain already? And it was it applied those type of rules to it and a lot of things downgraded from that. And Terraline benefits from that that intermingled work from Pathfinder. So it all kind of comes together. Thank you, Chris. I really appreciate that. The AFIO has members that are educators, and they may have an interest in becoming a partner. Uh, we'll call, you've described some of the partners, um, but could you give us a little more on the qualities that you look for when choosing a partner and the process they would go through? Sure. Um, the hardest part is agreeing on the, the the topic, and the topic is generally, you know, three words to a sentence. It's not going to be here's this. Key intelligence question with 27 subparts. We have found when you negotiate with those that that's too specific. So, you know, that's the hardest part is agreeing on the question. It's about a sentence, you know, um, Belt Road Initiative Investments in Latin America. That'll be the topic. It has enough latitude um, uh, to see where the data goes. Um, so that's the hardest part. Um, there has to be a value and benefit to the agency. Uh, so we work with internal stakeholders here. I call them helpers. So when I, we identify these helpers to, sh to help us kind of shape the content throughout that editing process, right? It's not editing in, in an editorial control way, but when I identify, say, Paycom and NGA folks embedded to Paycom, if, they're, if they want a piece and they said, hey, can you take a look at this? Those people serve as the helpers. And when the Terraline article comes out, they're also, they also help distribute that internally. So they're kind of dual hatted when we identify them. So what we look for, this is not just we go to the GIS department and that's the standard that helps. But it's just you can when you're talking and we meet, and we do the videos, you can get a sense of hustle. And that's that's that's, you know, a little fuzzy to to suss out. But that's what we're looking for, a serious commitment, because you get the students get named publication credit on these pieces. And so we're, we're not the American Medical Association Journal, and we're not a book review. We're right in the middle. And that's a big deal for a student to separate and differentiate themselves. And when NJ does the social media posts with those links, you're talking about tens or even hundreds of thousands of views on somebody's thesis that would have sat on a shelf and five people have read. So one of the ones that you saw recently on Afghanistan mining, the student was very interested in the metrics. He really wanted to know how many people uh, were reading and interacting with his piece. And when I shared him the numbers, he was just absolutely blown away. I said, well, there was 12,000 in the last two days. And he was expecting his academic advisor and four people in the library 
that may have, that may check it out. Uh, so it's it's big numbers. So it's not just the GIS departments that we look for. If we are doing a technical thing, it will come from say like the data science department at William and Mary. But it's not just that. So I described the Columbia uh, team. They had a journalism major on the team that provided incredible value. So there was kind of the technical team, the, the research, and there was a journalist uh, journalism student that was awesome at running down ground leads and doing interviews uh, to get at that information. So if we narrow cast just to the GIS department, we wouldn't have got the journalism student. So when we advertise, we, we always kind of say, hey, we're looking for a diverse team. And that means if you got somebody technical, great. But, it, you know, I use that journalism journalism example often to let people know that this is not just a niche thing. If you want to learn, you just have to hustle and we'll help you. Again, I get these great notes from the schools that say, hey, this is really hard. Students were really frustrated, but they look back and they love it because it's hard um, to do this. So we look for a diverse team when we're kind of negotiating um, and some of them we've found and didn't partner with. It just wasn't there. They might be in, in over their heads. They didn't. It didn't sound like they were going to get there. Um, so that's how we kind of determine through back and forth. So it's not just reading somebody's resume of, you know, I have five years experience with ArcGIS. That's that's not what we're we're looking for. So if I could just give a quick summary or description and what my takeaway is, is that anyone who would want to become a partner need to come to you with a project and outline what the benefit is and what they are going to do. And they also need to be able to bring together people who are from different specialties. Right. Very strong believer that you combine a technical person with someone who can write and investigate. You're going to get a lot more information and you're going to you're going to increase your knowledge more than you would if you just took a narrow focus of, yep. of say, just a data scientist. So I'm really pleased to hear that's what you're looking for and what you're doing. So as we prepared for this interview, you shared with Jim and I that your program became a program of record in a relatively short period of time. Are there any lessons learned from an innovation perspective that you'd like to share with our audience? Yeah, quite a few. And this has been a, a cool journey, but doing something that's never been done before is not easy anywhere. So, it, you know, the government gets a bad rap, but doing something that's never been done before, that's people are going to go, what, why are we doing that at, you know, small insurance companies or, you know, the, the Boy Scout Association? It's not just the government. It's a very human thing to anchor to what you know when you're in unknown territory. And there's been, you know, a lot of, of talk about, you know, innovation and what that is. I like to break it into two different categories. But before I, I talk about why I think that's important, there's kind of this idea that you go to the shark tank and you have a cool idea and everyone's going to clap. I found that not to be the case is you got to hang in there long enough. There is um, this is also borne out in corporate um, innovation cells. And there's been studies of these that they haven't performed very well because of the obsession with short term return on investment, asking too soon of doing something brand new, you're not gonna see it in 90 days. The things that are truly new, not just riffing on a base that already exists, but truly new, you're not gonna see the quote unquote results in 90 day sprints. It's gonna take a while to hang in there. And, you know, Terraline took a while to grab, you know, I, I wanted to hang in there long enough to get around five articles. And then once I had that, people would go, oh, this makes sense, right? But we had to hang in there long enough to get there rather than, oh, and, you know, you know, we did 90 days, we're out of here. Uh, there's no measurable success. So particularly with things that are new that have never been done before, you have to be patient um, and to let it mature to find its fit to go there. Also, just kind of separating evolution from more kind of breakout things, kind of a, a riff on a thing that already exists is absolutely necessary, but that's a different than doing something without a rear view mirror, right? And I, I, I believe that those need to be put in two separate buckets in thinking and funding um, as well. So, you know, set aside monies for things that have never been done before, because if they're competing in one giant bucket, the things that have never been done before are getting mushed in with things that have been around for a long time or say a 20% efficiency which those are two separate categories. So if you really want things to grow, 
you need to put things into more the long term, never been done before bucket to protect those. And we were able to do that with Terline. Be, uh, be kind of kind of the arguments that I was making of you know the, the short term uh, investment and give it some time. And we were able to carve out strategic patience on the funding side too to get this going. And now that it's there, it's very successful. But you know we had to be. We had, we had to give it real time and then kind of carve out an investment space to let it grow and not just mix it in with all of the other programs that are, you know, efficiencies that are absolutely necessary, but separating those project management efficiencies from things that have never been done before. And so we kind of were able to do that behind the scenes to protect it. And it was worth protecting. But there were there were people that said, ah, let's let's hang it up. and. You know, that would have been too soon. Uh, so strategic patience and not getting obsessed with ROI in five minutes and then protecting innovation dollars in its own category. I, I do remember when you first started this, that a lot of people were skeptical that the that we could take information from a classified environment and then do unclassified reporting and then, and that unclassified reporting would be beneficial. Right. Um, and, your, and the articles um, in the tear line are are very interesting and and the analytic methods are um impressive so definitely a great a great effort and um we wish you all the best as you continue i would really like to thank you chris for taking the time today i know you've got a lot of things that you need to get done so appreciate it we look forward to more conversations jim over to you for final words thanks jennifer well this has been a fascinating conversation it's been a lot of fun to listening in to both Jennifer and Chris make this presentation. I want to thank Jennifer Daniel and Chris Rasmussen and the NGA for a interesting and very informative presentation. Thank you.